Coming off of next-gen console announcements, a lot of buzz and excitement has been generating around features like ray tracing, competent CPUs, and fast SSDs. But one of the more low-key features announced for the Xbox Series X is variable rate shading, and has seemed some hot debate online. So in this video, I will talk exactly about what variable rate shading is, what its immediate effects will be for next-gen game engines, how we can understand it better, and what potential it has. To start off simply, variable rate shading is a new programmatic way for developers to more finely control how much effort the GPU expends into shading or rendering certain areas of a frame. In the past, each pixel generated by the GPU meant that one shading invocation occurred per pixel. So each pixel is being shaded individually as long as the game is not being upscaled to an output resolution. This makes sense for the high detail objects that we have in games, of course, but it does not scale ultra well to ultra high resolution screens that we have. Televisions made a four times jump in resolution from 1080p to 4K, and consumers expect their GPUs and consoles to keep up with that jump, but it's really not very realistic. So instead of just making GPUs bigger and denser, variable rate shading looks to smartly utilize GPU resources to help make higher resolution densities more viable. And when you think about it, it actually does make a lot of sense as to why developers have wanted this for so long. As I mentioned, traditionally having a rendered pixel on screen would mean you needed to spend the time shading each and every single individual pixel. But not every pixel is so different from the pixel next to it, or it's not wholly unique. If you look at the sky in a game, for example, you can see how most of those pixels in the sky are actually of an extremely similar color to the ones next to them. So why are we spending the time shading each pixel individually? It is very wasteful. The inner surface of the sky here when rendered at a lower resolution would basically look the exact same as one at a higher resolution. And this is what variable rate shading looks to kind of fix. For those areas of the screen that are perceptually homogeneous, variable rate shading will come in and shade those areas more coarsely. Instead of each and every pixel of a 4K image being shaded in the sky here, every 2x2 two two block might be shaded, or every 4x4 four four block might be shaded. And special 2x1 two or 1x2 blocks could be used to help more coarsely shade horizontal or vertical strips of detail. The way the game engine knows how to do this and use variable rate shading is based upon metrics. So the game engine will generate information about how bright certain pixels are compared to one another, or how similar they are in color to one another. Or if a game developer so wishes, how fast the pixels are moving by utilizing similar information called motion vectors, which are also used for anti-aliasing or motion blur. This generated image of a frame kind of looks like a stencil highlighting those areas of a frame where detail is present and where it is not. This is then compressed into a lower resolution image with color-coded blocks, which is then fed to the GPU. Here, the color-coded blocks tell the GPU how much of an area of a scene should be more coarsely shaded. This is essentially how it works. It's pretty simple, and pardon the pun, but the sky is not the limit here, and there are many areas of a screen that could be rendered with a more coarse shading rate that makes sense. In dark scenes, for example, where pixels are extremely similar to one another, or in bright scenes where there are shadows, or where textures in the distance are less detailed anyway, or in a cutscene in the area behind the depth of field which is blurry, or in a fast racing game on the sides of a screen where it's already covered in motion blur anyway. This tier 2 version of variable rate shading I described is available in Vulkan on PC, but also in DirectX 12 for Nvidia's Turing GPUs and has been announced to be in RDNA 2 GPUs and on the Xbox Series X console. Whether or not this hardware GPU feature is a part of the PlayStation 5 hardware has yet to be discussed. Beyond the hardware component, it's important to realize that this is now a baseline feature and part of an API available to many GPUs. And since it's official and many devices will start supporting it, it will see much more use than the last year and a half that Turing has supported it. And importantly, the DirectX implementation of this feature is apparently very developer friendly and just requires a few API calls and the developer feeding this multicolored textured image into the API. There are very little changes being needed to the game engine to support VRS. 
So how big of a deal is it though? And does it work well? Based upon the examples we've seen so far in games, the answer is actually yes. Looking at Wolfenstein Young Blood, which supports a Vulcan version of VRS, we at DF had a difficult time spotting the differences in image detail and image quality at normal viewing distances, and even when zooming in while playing the game in its performance VRS mode. This was the case while VRS offered an average of 10% or so more performance than the standard highest settings in the game with VRS off. So it was a practically invisible image quality difference with more performance, which is a win, but not a huge one if we're just looking at 10% here. Then we had the more recent Gears tactics. Here in this game, I noticed much bigger wins on the NVIDIA RTX 2080 Ti, and even bigger wins in some scenes on the RTX 2070 Super. Here in this scene, for example, VRS on the on mode adds 13% more performance, while turning to the performance mode adds nearly 30% more performance. These are much more significant performance advantages with DRS being set to on or in this performance mode, but also with more significant impacts to image quality. In this game, the VRS degradation of the image in both quality modes was more noticeable than that is found in Young Blood, so it wasn't a free lunch. It is important to stress that there are a number of reasons why this is the case in this game. Firstly, after talking with the developers at the Coalition, we know that Gears Tactics is actually not using the Tier 2 version of VRS. Rather, it is using the Tier 1 version, which has more limited and manual control over those areas of the image that can be degraded. So it's not based upon color, pixel motion, or luminance but it is done in a more manual fashion with object draw calls where the size of an object or it being in and out of fog of war or the presence of depth of field being those deciding factors that are significant as to whether an object has its shading rate being changed. So it's a bit more static in how it applies to the image and it's not as smart. In Gears Tactics, the camera is not swinging around or moving rapidly very often. Rather, it's just you tactically placing your troops while the camera sits still. So the static image impresses on your mind more, and you can notice the faults more easily as you have more time to essentially study the image. The VRS and Gears tactics in the current release state also affects the HUD and UI elements in the game, which made it more obvious as well. VRS does not need to affect the UI or HUD of the game, so that is something I would not think we will see in future titles utilizing this feature. Also, VRS as a feature by default does not filter the degraded regions of the screen. So unless a developer adds in a manner of filtering over the VRS, degraded regions of pixels could almost look like integer scaled pixels on a high res image. So the developer needs to think about that. In the end, the gameplay and gears tactics and camera type here, along with some other particular aspects, made it more obvious in gameplay. Interestingly though, all these aspects and negative points completely disappear as soon as you get to Gears Tactics cutscenes. With those same VRS shading settings, I found it much harder to spot the visual differences from VRS being on in the game cutscenes, even in the performance mode. This makes sense as the camera is more active here, the scenes are more visually diverse, and there is depth of field or motion blur obscuring parts of the screen more often. Here, those same VRS settings, which were more obvious in the gameplay top-down view, are less obvious in the cutscenes, even though the metrics deciding how to change shading are the exact same. At the same time, the increases that VRS modes have in these cutscenes, in terms of performance, are more variable. Running the first cutscene in the game, gains for putting VRS to on on an RTX 2070 Super meant an average of 9% better performance and only 10% better performance in the performance mode. And those are averages, so a number of shots actually saw much smaller differences. So a lot less performance was gained from VRS on average than the gameplay camera angle in these cutscenes. There are a good number of reasons why this is most likely the case, that we're seeing this discrepancy between cutscenes and gameplay. Theoretically, if Gears Tactics was using the Tier 2 version of VRS, with the VRS being determined by image properties, then the image needs regions of low complexity for variable rate shading to come in and start changing the quality. If a scene or camera angle does not have such areas where 
pixels are more similar to one another, then variable rate shading will not purposefully come in and degrade the shading there. This is a good thing, of course, because it means VRS is working as it tries to keep the shading quality up for regions that need that detail anyway. But that does mean that we're also not going to be seeing as many performance wins by turning VRS on for such a scene. Another reason why such scenes would see less gains from VRS is because the GPU in these scenes might not be as stressed by the shading of the scene, which is what VRS looks to help in performance. For example, a GPU like the RTX 2070 Super might be limited by the amount of memory bandwidth available at such a high resolution like 4K. I tested this simply in the game in the opening cutscenes by turning off the bandwidth sapping depth of field effect. With depth of field off and memory bandwidth pressure being eased on the GPU, the performance mode for VRS scaled to being 15% more performant than VRS set to off, where it was only 10% more performant with the depth of field on. The game with depth of field off is more limited by shading instead of bandwidth, so VRS was more effective. Another way this can be tested is by turning down the quality of shading in Gears Tactics by turning off more expensive modes for reflections and ambient occlusion and all that stuff. Here, the cost per pixel goes down when you turn down the graphic settings. So shading is not the most expensive part of a frame relatively necessarily. Thus, reducing the shading with VRS has less of an overall performance impact. Using these less intensive settings, the VRS performance mode's average frame rate increase goes down to just 6% in the cutscenes. So the VRS is degrading the image similar to the same manner as before, but it's just that the lesson settings means shading's less significant for performance, and VRS is less effective. And lastly, there's a technical reason why VRS may not work so effectively at times in these cutscenes. For VRS to work most efficiently, the size of triangles on game models must not be pixel sized or smaller. There's a technical reason behind this that has to do with how GPUs function, but if a triangle on a model is pixel sized or smaller in screen space, then the GPU wastes cycles over shading it, as it is called. Even if VRS is on and is telling the GPU to degrade that area of the screen because the pixels look so similar there. So ultra detailed models where the triangles are much smaller than the pixels on screen make variable rate shading less effective but they also make GPUs less efficient in general. So you wouldn't want to have this happening in a game anyway. So good VRS scaling goes in tandem with good level of detail management in a game to make sure models are not overly detailed for the amount of pixels that they have on screen. That sounds like a lot of things to consider, but really these things are already being considered by game developers when they're making a game. So VRS works in tandem with other optimization strategies that a game developer will also already be doing. So they kind of mutually reinforce one another. VRS is essentially just another optimization tool in the toolbox for developers to easily implement and one that synergizes well with other optimizations. So it works synergistically with dynamic resolution scaling. It works synergistically with more accurate utilization of geometry on screen that you could perhaps enable by utilizing a mesh shader. It is just one new part to help developers extract the most performance as possible at any one time from the GPU. And as I understand it though, this usage of VRS I talked about in this video is just the starting point and the easiest way to utilize it. There are indeed more to come beyond these initial first implementations. A great historical example of what I mean could be found with something called CSAA which was a type of hardware multi-sample anti-aliasing supported on the Xbox One, PS4, and a number of AMD GPUs. The exploitation of this hardware feature being used in ways other than conceived led to the rise of modern image reconstruction as it is through checkerboard rendering, or it was originally called the MSAA trick that was coined by Sebastian Alaton. So look what checkerboard rendering has gotten us. Some of the greatest looking graphics and image quality found on consoles with games like Horizon Zero Dawn. Such non-standard exploitation of hardware, like CSAA, will probably also happen for VRS. And there are already hints about how that could be done based upon official presentations by Microsoft. At the end of the VRS Deep Dive presentation at GDC 2019, a key engineer from Microsoft's Advanced Technology Group, Martin Fuller, 
mused on a number of theoretical ways to utilize VRS principles to speed up game engines beyond just using it for pixel shading. Kind of like checkerboard rendering, Fuller emphasizes how VRS principles can be used to smartly and sparsely render things like screen space ambient occlusion, or screen space reflections even. But really one of the most interesting parts of his discussion was the usage of VRS principles and concepts to sparsely render the lighting of a game for those game engines which utilize deferred lighting, which is a very common way engines are built, such as Unreal Engine 4, for example. Here, the stencil map made by VRS and that VRS color map I talked about earlier can be utilized together to lessen the lighting calculations needed in a game engine, with essentially no perceptible difference for the human eye while also saving performance in high complexity scenes by nearly 30%. That is a cost saving on top of that which VRS would already have, by the way. In the end, I really wouldn't be surprised if a number of Microsoft first party titles ended up leveraging a technique like this. And this is a presentation from over a year ago, so more research has certainly happened in the intervening period. Much like ray tracing, there's much room for innovation and imagination over the course of an entire console generation, and I eagerly await to see what interesting things developers will come up with. In the meantime though, I hope you enjoyed this video on variable ray shading and understand it a bit more, its pitfalls and how it works, for example. A great feature for developers to use and exploit in the next generation of games. And if you did like it, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you are already a subscriber, then please consider hitting that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to talk to me about VRS or anything like it, write a comment below or follow me in Digital Foundry on Twitter. And if you want to see this video in the highest quality possible, follow us on Patreon. And as always, this is Alex bidding you farewell und auf Wiedersehen.